welcome everyone uh, to this talk, my presentation about network flow analysis uh, using NetFlow protocols and TFlow2, which is a software I've wrote uh, last winter. Um, it's nice to see so many people around here in this room. I was expecting maybe 10, 20 people. I see many more here. Um, I shortly go through the agenda. Um, so first I'll introduce myself. Who am I? Uh, what is a flow? What is NetFlow? And why would I even like to collect this flow information? Um, what are these NetFlow protocols? What exists there out on the market uh, that you can utilize to get flow information from uh, your network? Um, then I will be talking about how I try to find usable collection and analysis solutions. Um, there wasn't too much out there that was usable for me, to say the least. Um, I'll be talking about TFlow uh, in more detail, um, down to really down to implementation details in the Go language, and what I found to be uh, fast and what was too slow uh, on packages that is in the Go that, that, that are in the Go in the Go bind, uh, in the Go default um, packages. Um, and in the end, there will be a demo on TFlow too, so you can see it in action. Um, yeah, who am I? My name is Oliver Herms. Uh, may, uh, you may know me as uh, you know me as Takt as well. Um, I'm a network engineer or network SRE, somewhere in between. Um, I'm working for AS51324, also known as XRing AG at the moment. Uh, you may know our product Waipu TV. Uh, it's very good. <laughs> um, uh, until recently, I used to work for Google, AS15169 in network operations and the network SRE. Um, now I'm back, um, and that's not enough networking for me, and that's why I also work on uh, AS201701, the Freifunk Rhineland backbone. Um, I'm LPX3 certified, CCMP, Gen CIP, source provider, blah, blah, blah. You might not care about that. Um, so let's go deeper and go to the actual topic, like what is a flow? So a flow in a network is a unidirectional sequence of packets that share certain properties. So what does that typically mean? So when a packet goes, every packet has some properties, like uh, you have a source IP address, you have a destination IP address, you have a source MAC address, destination MAC address, source port, destination port, and whatnot. There's lots of information that is not the payload, but it's actually metadata that is used to forward the packets to the right uh, destination. Um, so a flow is an end tuple. Um, typically, it's a source IP, destination IP protocol, source port, source port and destination port, and that's mostly what people agree on that, that this is a flow. Or what you can say is it's pretty much a communication flow between two sockets on two machines. Um, that is what a flow is. So all packets in the network belong to, to a flow. A uh, flow might be just one packet, or it can be millions of packets over the time. A flow can be living for, I don't know, one second. Flow can be living for hours, days, weeks, months even years. So if you keep your SSH connection open, for example, for a year, that is one network flow. It's one TCP connection, and it's identified by a four tuple or five tuple of source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and protocol. And that's it. And that's a flow. Um, so what is NetFlow? So NetFlow is a lightweight family of protocols that is used to analyze network traffic. So you have a network, and just imagine you have traffic going, and you can see it counter. You can see it counters um, how much traffic is going from one interface to another interface, and maybe maybe you notice that interface is full, or you're dropping packets or whatever. And uh, maybe you want to have a deeper insight on what is actually going on. That's what NetFlow is there for. Um, so it samples these flows. So the so the machine, the router, or the switch keeps track of what flows it was forwarding packets for and counts the packets and the bytes. So the this is the volume uh, of the traffic that was forwarding. And it was invented by Cisco initially. Um, so what components are actually involved when I use NetFlow? So you can see here is in the middle, you have a router, and the router actually forwards some packets for a user or for whatnot. Um, and what that router does, as I said, it tracks which flows are going through. Um, and these flows are periodically exported in special packets and being sent to a to a destination. A destination is a NetFlow collector. A NetFlow collector reads in the packets and gets all the metadata about which flows have been passing through the router. 
So what that for character usually does is either it keeps it in RAM information uh, for some time, uh, or it stores it on long-term storage, like disks, SSDs, or, what, or whatever. Um, and what you then usually want, like you have the data, but that's not the thing that you want. What you want is you want to have analysis of the data. You want to look into it. You want to see what is this data used for. How, or like, you want to analyze it. Uh, where's traffic going? Uh, where's it coming from? When was it? How much? Um, did it increase? Did it decrease? There's certain reasons why you want to have this. Um, yeah, why would you collect metadata? The biggest reason for, my, for me personally as an adopt person is uh, troubleshooting. So whenever you have congestion in a network, a link is full, the only thing you see is that the link is full. You have no idea where traffic comes from, you have no idea where traffic goes to, you have no idea how to mitigate if you don't have net flow information. Um, you could sniff on the interface with TCP dump or something and see actually what is going there and make a guess like uh, traffic's going from here to there. But turns out on big routers, you have no TCP dump. Uh, at least not for the, for the forwarding plane. Um, or when you have a DDoS attack, your links run full. Again, question is who's under attack, which IP address? Because you need to know who's under attack so you can install maybe a black holding route or something so that the traffic gets dropped at a perimeter and doesn't congest your backbone network. Um, another reason to have this is capacity planning. Like you want to know um, if this link goes down, where's the traffic actually going? So let's say you have a link from one point to another point and you have a backup link that's somewhere else and you want to know if that backup link is big enough. Um, you have two ways. You can either look at where's the traffic going on the link that is utilized or what you can do is you can just shut down that link and see what happens. Uh, but that's not the way you want to do it in a bigger network and you have users on it. And uh, the third reason might be somewhat important to some of you uh, is security because it gives you some insight on who's communicating with whom on the network. Um, you may see network flows like SSH sessions to machines that should not be there, like between, te bet between two machines. Like you have a, let's say you have a VLAN with regular uh, workers in your company and you have an engineering VLAN and suddenly you see that you have actually SSH connections from uh, the regular VLAN to your production network uh, where all your servers are and they should not exist. And maybe it turns out that your routers failed to program the firewall rules properly. I've seen stuff like that, and it was found using that flow. Um, of course, you can also look at the logs on the server itself, but then you have to visit uh, all the servers if you don't have centralized logging. Um, and this is a quite easy solution to check out if you have any illegal flows in the network. So there's different network ver uh, NetFlow versions out there. Um, just to make it short, NetFlow version 1 to 8, um, they only support IPv4. So I wasn't considered to, using the, to use them at all. Uh, they only support a fixed set of attributes, which means um, if anything changes in network environment, environment, like you add MPLS to your network, you want to have MPLS um, labels um, on, the, on the packets, you want to see which label was used to forward a packet, uh, and you have NetFlow version that doesn't support MPLS, yeah, you are screwed. Um, you have to wait for a new NetFlow version. That's how it was in the past. But uh, luckily, then they invented NetFlow version 9. And NetFlow version 9 works um, uh, with a templating system that allows the variable range of attributes to be carried on uh, on the packet. So that means the router is not just sending the data packets where it says there was a flow from X to Y. Uh, this amount of bytes, whatnot, but it also sends a template and says, that says this field number one, to, uh, like the, this is a template number one, two, three, and uh, there's this field and this field, and it means this and this, and there's this field, and that means this. Um, this, this is sent out, and on the data packet, the template's being referenced to see what that data actually means. So you need the template to make sense of the data packet. Otherwise, the data is completely pointless for you. That's how NetFlow version nine works. Um, it supports v4 and v6, um, and this templating system makes it somewhat complex because you have to keep track of the templates. Um, and you cannot just read in the packet and say uh, offset, I don't know, 12 bytes, and there's the source IP address. That's not how it works in NetFlow version 9. Uh, and also there's IP fix, that's also known as NetFlow version 10, kind of. Um, it's basically the same. Um, it uses a different wording and a slightly different header. Uh, and I'm actually not sure actually why it was invented like this. Um, maybe someone in the room knows, especially in the front. Um, 
I was just told by people that, yeah, you support Netflow version 9. Like I, I implemented Net, uh, Tflow in the first place with Netflow version 9 support. And then people came to me and said, yeah, you know what? Uh, I have a nice Juniper MX router and it only supports IP fix. It's like, hmm, okay. I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes in more detail. So let's deep dive into version 9 um, because that's what I implemented in the first place. Um, it's defined in RFC 3954 and the general packet format is that you have a header. Um, and in the header, you have a very variable amount of templates and data flow sets and option template flow sets. So the template flow sets, they include the templates, as I said, that, that I just mentioned. Uh, the data flow set is the data that is referring to the template. Um, they can be in different packets, so they don't need to be in the same one. Like you send a template, like maybe every half an hour from the router, you can configure that on the router usually. It sends it out. And the data packets, they are coming in a stream. Like they are popping up every few milliseconds. Um, and the options, there's stuff in like, if you use sampling on a network, uh, you just use, you can say, I don't want to know every flow. You can say, I want to know every, I don't know, 16, 30 second uh, flow or 64 flow or every thousands flow or I don't know what. Uh, so if you have a lot of, lot of flows, you don't want to export all of them because it's a lot of information uh, and it's hard. Uh, to maintain them in in machines, and you need a lot of resources if you export them all on a big network. So you can you can configure sampling, and if you configure sampling, uh, the NetFlow packet will will tell you that this data here is actually sampled data. So if you want to uh, interpret it, and you want to uh, see how much traffic is actually going, you have to multiply this by a certain factor that was configured on the router, and it tells you in the in the option. Uh, this option thingy, unfortunately, is not supported in Tflow yet. Um, but that's a detail. Um, the Netflow version 9 header is quite simple. So there's a 16-bit field. It's the first one. is a version number. That's usually set to 9. For IP fix, it is set to 10. <laughs> um, there's a phone ringing here. There's a count uh, field that is 16-bit as well. That tells us how many records do we have in the data packet, so we know uh, where it actually ends, how long it is. Uh, there's a sys uptime, that is the uptime of the source of the NetFlow packets in milliseconds. I don't know why that is there. Um, I never needed it. Um, it just exists. Um, the next thing is more interesting, there's Unix seconds. Um, that is the timestamp when this NetFlow data has been emitted by the router. So it tells you this information was at a certain point in time. Uh, sequence number, so all the packets that are being emitted by the router, uh, they are sequenced. That, allow you, uh, that allows you to see if any packets have been dropped uh, because NetFlow data is usually transmitted using UDP. You send UDP packets from a router to a remote host, well, it can, can get lost. If you have congestion in the network, it can be lost. And again, what you can do is then, if you want to calculate like, how much traffic would it actually be, you get a factor of like, let's say you see every second packet is lost, you can just multiply all your traffic by two and you have an idea like, how much is it actually? Um, and then there's the source ID that identifies an observation domain. Um, I think that can be used if you have VRFs and stuff on routers uh, and then it's just that, that the VRF ID is in there or something. <laughs> Usually it's set to zero in all my setups at least um, and Tflow doesn't take care of the source ID. If you want to run multiple instances, you have to run multiple binary instances, multiple processes. Uh, it's not differentiating it at the moment. Uh, so the header is easy, but here comes the template flow set format. <laughs> this looks a bit ridiculous. Um, so all these data um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the packet uh, actually has kind of the same header format again. And the header format is like the very first two fields. Like there's a flow set ID that is set to zero. And the zero means this is a template. If there's a value that's not zero, it means this is a data packet. Zero means this is a flow, uh, this is a template packet. Um, then length tells us, okay, how long is the packet? Um, and then in there comes the template. What we can see is there's a template ID uh, 256 that says, here's a template with the ID 256, and then it starts. And it says this template has field count amount of fields. And then it tells us, okay, there's type number one, uh, for example, this can be a source IP address, um, and this is four bytes long. And then the next field can be, this is IPv6 source address, and this is actually 16 bytes long. Um, and this is how it describes what the NetFlow uh, data packet will look like. 
And in the data packet, it refers to this template ID, in this case, the 256, that would be in the data packet. That's how it works. Um, and then comes the data flow set format. So the data flow, again, there's flow set ID and length. As I said, this is the common header between the two. Um, the flow set ID tells us which template we have to use to decode this packet. And the length tells us how long is this, how long is, uh, uh, how long is this flow information. Uh, so we know where the next one starts. Um, and that's basically how we get the information out of the packets. It keeps some, it, it requires some state. It's, I don't like state, but this makes it very flexible. Um, I think it's a good solution. So there's also IPFIX, as I said. Um, it's mostly the same as for version 9. Uh, the packet headers differ slightly. Uh, what, what differs mostly is the wording. Um, and getting from my NetFlow version 9 packet decoder to, Net, to an IPFIX packet decoder took me less than two hours. Like I copied the, the thingy, renamed some variables uh, to adjust to the RFC, uh, removed one header field, uh, compiled it, started it, and wait, it just worked. It was so simple. Um, so here you can see IPFIX versus NetFlow version 9. What you can actually see is, well, there's a packet header in Netflow version 9, and there's a message header in IPFIX. Isn't that amazing? And then there's template flow set, and there's a template set. And we have data flow set in both Netflow, and we have the data set in IPFIX. So it's exactly the same. Um, here comes the, big, the biggest difference, actually, is the header format of the Netflow packet overall. So on the left side, you can see the Netflow version 9 packet header. On the right side, you see IPFIX. Um, all these fields have actually been renamed. Um, the interpretation of count and length are a bit different. Count means how many records do I have. Length really means how many bytes do I have after this field. Um, this uptime um, just got removed from IPFIX. It's not there anymore, seemingly because nobody needs it, as I said. Uh, Unix seconds is export time. Sequence number is the same. Source ID just got renamed to observation domain ID. It's all the same. Um, the same thing for template flow set. You can see this here on the, on the left side in the very left, left top. It says flow set ID equals zero. In IPFIX, it says set ID equals two. So in IPFIX, the template is not ID zero, but ID two. That's the only difference. Um, well, the data flow set format is again kind of the same, just that it is a different wording flow set ID versus set ID. And length is the same, and then all the rest is the same. Um, short X course, there's a protocol called S-Flow. S-Flow is a lie because it doesn't take care of flows, but what it actually does is it samples, it samples frames or packets um, and adds information about like interfaces and stuff. Um, so basically what the, what, the, what the device does is it receives a, a, pack, a frame, let's say, it has an Ethernet switch, it receives a frame. It just picks one out of, let's say, whatever you configure, out, one out of a thousand. Picks a random packet, and checks out what was the ingress interface, what is the egress interface on the switch, what is the, the, uh, then the just copies the whole packet uh, up to a certain size, uh, cuts off the rest, encapsulates it, and sends it to a collector. That is what S-Flow does, as far as I know. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't aggregate into flows at all. It's not tracking any all the flows that are passing through a router. Um, so this is very cheap to implement for device vendors. But also, I think, accuracy-wise, it's not the best thing to do. And S-Flow is currently not supported in uh, T-Flow. So why did I actually start this T-Flow project? Um, as I said in the, in the introduction, I work on AS201701, the Freifunk Reinhardt Backbone. And uh, I used to work in Google. And uh, in Google, I was used to have fancy tools uh, to analyze NetFlow data. Uh, they give me information like from where to where is traffic going in case I have congestion, so I know what I have to do as an NetOps person. Um, we're not suffering in Freifunk Rheinland from too much congestion at the moment, but it happens. Like we had DDoS attacks and stuff going on, and you wanted to know where is traffic actually going. Um, so I need a solution to find out where is traffic going. Um, the Freifunk Rheinland backbone consists of six routers that are actually forwarding around about one million flows per minute. Uh, flows per minute means that's either a flow that started before this one minute window and ended be be after this one minute window. It can be a flow that just started and ended within the one minute window. 
or it can be a flow that just ended in a one-minute window, or it can be one that started in a one-minute window. Um, I don't actually know how long, how long living these flows are, but if I export all, all flows on the router every 60 seconds, I get one million uh, data sets out of, the, out, of these, out of our routers. Um, as some people might know, we use Linux uh, on the routers. They, it, they are just cheap x86 machines uh, with a Debian on and BERT. Um, how do I get out? How do I get NetFlow information out of that box? Uh, we use IPT NetFlow, which is a kernel module, uh, an extension for IP tables. And what you basically do is you just say IP tables dash a forward dash j NetFlow, and it goes into this module, and the module keeps track of all the flows and exports the data to the collector. Um, the Linux kernel is not keeping track of ASN information, so there's no information about autonomous systems. You don't know from what ASN did the data come, to which ASN did it go, it's not there. So IPT NetFlow cannot export this information as it's not present in the kernel. So I somehow had to augment that later on, um, and I was trying to find a solution that allows me to do this, and there was simply none. Um, we wanted to have 100% flow sampling for accuracy. Well, of course, if you design something new, you're aiming for uh, high targets. Um, so my, my idea was that all these 1 million flows per minute should be processable on one machine, um, on a regular, quite cheap machine, like, I don't know, a quad-core i7 with 64 gigs RAM, and it should be able to cope with this load. Um, yeah, we need an efficient solution uh, because, well, the Freifunk Rheinland doesn't have too much money uh, to throw out just to get NetFlow information for us as engineers uh, in case we need it. So, yeah, efficiency was a must. So I looked at available solutions. Uh, solutions because none of this was a solution to me. Um, the classic thing to use is NFDump and NFZen. Uh, NFDump is basically a daemon. So you have NFDump, I think it's called, running that collects NetFlow packets or IPFIX packets and dumps them into binary files. And then you have a command line tool uh, and you can, you can fire queries against that data on the drive. It's not coming from RAM, it always comes from drive. And that reports you actually uh, text data and not graphs over time. So you have to say like, okay, that five minute window, make a query. And then it tells you, there was this flow and this five minute window, it was making five megabytes of traffic. And if you want to have want to get the data for five minutes back, you have to do another query for another time window and say, give me for that time window the sum and tells you, yeah, there was another five megabytes. So if you want to see it over time, you have to make lots of queries and build the graphing yourself because it's not there. What you can do in NFZen is you can put recording rules in and say, when data comes in, put them through this logic here. And if they match these, if the flows match this criteria, write the data into RRD files, and then you get a graph, um, ugly RRD graph. Um, it's not state of the art to me, at least. Um, NFZen is the web front end for it. Um, it's written in PHP. Uh, I won't comment on that. So setting it up is pain in the ass. Um, then there's this PMACCT thingy uh, that I had to look at. It was very complex to set up. And the fact that it throws all the information into regular purpose databases like MySQL or Postgres or MongoDB, um, and I have 1 million inserts per minute, uh, which is, I think, 16,000 per second or something. It's quite a lot. Uh, and just one machine to get the job done um, made me doubt that this is actually possible with these resources and this software. Commercial solutions, um, I just had a look at what is on the market, but I didn't have hands-on, I didn't have any hands-on experience. Uh, but we found them all too, too pricey or too inflexible or nah, they are just not open source. Uh, so what was my first approach to get my, my own solution? Uh, my very first Go program in early 2016 was to write uh, a NetFlow to Prometheus gateway and just export all the attributes as labels. <laughs> um, one needs to know that Prometheus um, doesn't like to, to keep track of too many labels because every combination of labels is its own variable. And I was basically just killing it with too many variables uh, in the database. So it was too many, this was too many time series, basically. Um, it, just, it just fell over within a few seconds. Next approach. Um, NetFlow to MySQL gateway. Um, so I defined a single MySQL table 
with an index on every column because you want to run queries later on. Uh, and if you don't have queries, it reads in the whole table. Um, so single table, plenty of columns, lots of indices on, and I was just inserting data into the database. I wasn't running any queries. And the CPU was just immediately like 100% and the box was just falling over. So, meh, did not work. Third approach. Um, the first bigger Go program that I wrote that was not that trivial was Tflow version one. Um, that stored all the flow information that was coming in only in RAM. This database was made of AVL trees. So an AVL tree is a binary tree that balances itself. So in case that I insert um, sorted data, uh, it makes sure that the tree is balanced and it doesn't become a linked list. That's very important for uh, performance of queries and inserts. So what was this, the structure was like this. There was one tree for the source IP addresses. And in there, in the node, there was the value. So let's say an IP address 8888. And there was another pointer to the next AVL tree. And that tree was keeping track of the next attribute. Let's say destination IP address, 1234. And then in there, there was another tree that was keeping track of the next attribute, and the next attribute, and the next attribute. So you had to traverse, like, I don't know, if we have, let's say we have 12 attributes, you had to traverse up to 12 trees. Um, it worked. It was not the fastest, but also not as bad as the Prometheus solution and not as bad as the MySQL solution. Um, and it was very memory efficient, but I never released it to the public because all the code was living in one package and stuff like that. Um, it wasn't well designed. Um, and it, I wasn't using it for so, quite some time. So I just put it into the corner and say, yeah, I will, we will not use this in production. So then came the fourth approach, Tflow version two. And this was aimed to be released to the public. I was like, okay, now I have some experience with Go. Um, I think I can find a better solution to get things done. And I was coming back from my sabbatical last year, and uh, my colleagues have been so so good to me that they gave me all their on-call shifts for the winter, on the weekends as, as, especially. So I was sitting in Dublin. Uh, it's raining outside, so I wasn't caring too much about it, sitting inside, um, keeping yeah, uh, keeping care, taking care of the network. Um, nothing happened usually, uh, so I had plenty of time to focus on my problem and start uh, hacking on Tflow too. So I redesigned the database layer and added a nice web interface. Oh, nice web interface. There are some people here in the room that, that won't agree with that. And eventually I implemented the file storage layer to keep flow information not only in RAM, but also on disk. Uh, I added an annotation layer, uh, annotation layer to add BGP information, like autonomous system numbers that are lacking from the IP tables NetFlow module. So I actually have ASN information. Um, and it turned out that I had to re-implement the NetFlow version 9 decoder that I was using. And later on, I also implemented IPFix. Um, so what does Tflow 2 actually look like? This is the general design. On the very top, you see the router that sends uh, NetFlow packets via UDP. And there's two uh, modules running that are there to receive NetFlow packets or IPFix packets. There's NetFlow version 9 server and the IPFix server. Well, guess what they do? NetFlow version 9 takes care of NetFlow version 9, and the IPFix one takes care of, Net of IPFix. So there's two open UDP sockets where they receive the data. Um, from there, via a channel in Go, it goes into the annotator layer. The annotator layer, um, at the moment, can put stuff through the BERT annotator or not put it through there. You can control that with a command line flag when you start the Tflow binary. Um, so, it comes back, so either it goes through the BERT annotator or not, depends. The BERT annotator, there's one piece missing here, actually talks to a bird instance, and a bird is a routing daemon. Um, and this routing daemon uh, has all the, uh, all the ASN information for all the prefixes, and with the prefixes for the IP addresses that we are actually trying to get information for. So once the annotator is done, um, it updates the stats package and says, uh, by the way, I received a NetFlow packet, or I received an IPFix packet, and this is it was this big, um, so you can actually monitor what Tflow is doing in the background. That stuff is exported via HTTP and can be scraped with Prometheus. Um, so 
But that's not all what the annotator does. The annotator also, of course, forwards the data to the database layer. So the database layer can keep the stuff in memory and organize the data uh, in a way that we can run fast queries, but it's also not too, uh, too expensive to add data into a database. Because as I mentioned, we have to add like data 16,000 times a second, which is not too trivial, actually. Uh, it's not a task you want to run on regular purpose databases, as I mentioned already. Um, so there was quite some issues during development, uh, actually plenty of them, because everything that I was doing was too slow. So one first thing that I, that I realized was when I did a query on the database um, and I looked at all traffic on interface and I just said, give me all the traffic on interface, like no, no more criteria, just said, I want to have the Refrain from Rheinland DKIX interface. Tell me what traffic is there. And it was saying 800 megabits. But in fact, the other monitoring from the, from the counters of the, uh, of the interfaces on the routers, they were saying, here's 2.4 gigabits going. Hmm. Where's all the, where are all the flows going? Either the IPT net flow is lying, but probably my software is wrong. Um, so I started digging around in my software if I do any calculations or something going wrong or, no, it wasn't. So later on, I came to the idea, hmm, maybe I'm not reading the packets, the NetFlow packets, fast enough from the kernel space, and the buffer is running over. So I tried to figure out how can I check that, and turned out there's ProcNet UDP and ProcNet UDP 6 files. Um, and when I checked them, they were showing plenty of, plenty of drops of packets. Um, that was explaining to me why my data must have been wrong. So you think like, just read faster, how hard can it be? Um, so I parallelized the workflow and say, you know what, I'm gonna have multiple go, go routines that all read from the same socket. But actually my CPU was at 100% already. So it wasn't helping. I increased the buffer size, um, that helped for a short moment, um, but not long term. I mean, it, it could have been spikes. So for spike, spiky loads, larger buffers would help, but in fact, it was just, there was data was coming into the buffer too fast and I was draining it too slow. That was just a fact. So what I did is I started profiling what is Tflow 2 actually spending its CPU time on? Why is it so slow? And it turned out there was this, this NetFlow decoder that I found on GitHub from FLN, uh, it was called NF9 packet, and that didn't perform very well. 90% uh, of CPU time was running into that package that I didn't implement, my, that I didn't even implement myself. I just wanted it to decode the NetFlow packet and give me a struct and give me all the data. Yeah, 90% of CPU time. But the graph that I had, unfortunately, I've thrown them all away. Um, the nice profiling graphs, I would have loved to show them to you, but uh, I was too lazy to reproduce them all and check out old versions of the software and let them run against production again and profile them again and stuff. So I'm sorry about not having the graphs. But what it was showing actually that, all, that nearly all the CPU time was then going into the encoding slash binary package, which is a package of the standard library of the Go uh, distribution. Uh, and there's a package, there's a, um, there's a function or a method that's called read. And that was used to read data from a byte buffer into a struct. Doesn't sound too bad, huh? This is the standard way of doing things in Go. But I had a look into the package, of the, into this binary package. What is it actually doing? And in the function, we can see on the first line, it says reflect. What does that mean? Reflect means there's a f that this is a function that has a parameter that takes everything, whatever data type, and Go is a type-safe language. So it's taking whatever you're throwing in, but then it needs to know what it actually is. So how does the program find out what is this data type that you just gave me? Like you're giving it a struct and saying, this is the struct that you want to have filled with this binary data, but it doesn't know the struct, so it has to Break it up and, uh, and and have a look like what is in there, and that's what what is what reflection is used for. And reflection is slow as hell. And remember, I had to do this like a few thousand times per second. This sucks. So what I did, I thought about how can I re-implement this, and I was googling for ways uh, to decode packets without this binary dot read function. And there was mailing list entries, and the mailing list were basically saying, no, no, this is the proper way to do it. This is how you have to do it. There is no other way. I was like, no, there must be another way. It might not be supported very well, but there is one. 
So what I did is I re-implemented the whole package um, with the same external interface because the software was using it already and the interface looked fine. Uh, but the implementation, the internals, uh, I implemented now in a much cheaper way. And what it does is, instead of reflection and the binary read package, it actually uses casting of data. Uh, and this increased the performance at least tenfold. I'm not, I don't remember exactly how much better it became, but it was at least 10, 10x better, at least. Uh, so suddenly I was able to, to process all flows coming in without dropping a single one. So the ProcNet UDP was not showing any drops anymore, which was a good achievement already. Um, so how does this new Netflix decoder work? As I said, um, we are casting. So when you read from a socket in Go, what you actually get is a byte slice. But a byte slice is nothing that you can get uh, the raw address uh, of the data that is pointing to from. Because um, the byte slice is actually a struct that has unexported fields. And one of the unexported fields within uh, the byte slice, within the slice is uh, there's, a, there's, one point, there's one variable in that points to an array. And what I need is, I need this, exactly this pointer address that it's pointing to, but I can't get it because I exported. So I can't work with a byte slice, obviously. So what I do is, I copy the stuff into a static size array, because from the static size array, I can straight get the address using the unsafe package. Um, and then I have just memory, that's a pointer to, to some memory, and I can use the unsafe package to cast the shit out of it, basically. So I have a struct, and I just say, there's 1,500 bytes, take the first few hundred uh, for this struct, this struct is exactly a few hundred bytes long, and just reinterpret it. Um, it's like, template, like, re it's like literally like, put, like putting a template uh, on something and cutting stuff out. And this is without copying any data. Um, this is the way how one would implement this in C anyways. So yeah, that's, how, that's why the NetFlow decoder performs so well, because it's not copying any data around, it's not using any reflection, uh, and I guess there's not much room to make it any faster than it is. Um, if you have ideas how to make it even faster, feel free to send me pull requests. Uh, let's talk about the database layer next. So what's actually a flow? How do I represent a flow? This is what a flow looks like. There's plenty of data in. You might be wondering about certain data types here. Um, for example, let's take the protocol field here. It's a UIN32. Um, but in an IP header, the protocol field is an 8-bit field. Why am I wasting so much memory here? And the reason is that this data structure actually comes from a protobuffer. And protobuf is a binary format from Google um, that I use to serialize the data on the disk. Because it allows me to do that with very little uh, CPU overhead. And it's not offering me anything smaller uh, than UN32. Or what I can take is a byte. But there's no, no UN8. Um, maybe I can one day change that to, to, use, uh, to use the byte, because that's 8 bits as well. But for the moment, uh, that's how it is. I'm wasting memory, I know, but uh, this was the best way to implement it for the moment. So this data needs to be stored somehow in a way that we can actually find it quickly, and also uh, that it can be added into the data structures uh, with not too much CPU overhead. Because again, we're doing this a few thousand times a second. So the main variable that keeps the whole database actually is of the top type over there that says flows by time and router. Um, there's a map to a map. So a map in Go is basically a hash. Uh, it's a hash of a hash. And the first index, the N64, is a timestamp. Like what time are we talking about for the, t for the flow? The next thing is what, what router uh, reported this flow. Um, this is represented as a string. The reason for this is uh, an IP address, net.ip type, is a byte slice, and a byte slice cannot be used as an index on hash in Go. Um, I heard that one can use a struct that actually points to a byte slice, <laughs> but I didn't implement that yet. So for the moment, it is a string. Um, again, probably not the best solution, but it is fast enough for the moment. And then what this thingy points to is a time group, and the time group there becomes interesting. So 
for each and every attribute that we have in that in our, in our flows, we have a field there that's actually a map of the type of that attribute. So for example, let's take the protocol and protocol says it's a map U in 32 because you, U in 32, why? Because it is here U in 32 as well. And the same value was used here to access the map. But what do we find then? So flow comes in, we have a timestamp, we have a router. Um, so we find this time group thingy. Then it says protocol is six or 17 usually. Let's say it's six and we access the six here. And then it, there's a point tattoo in AVL tree. Why is that? And what are we actually storing in the AVL tree? What we're storing in the AVL tree is the pointer to this thingy. Why is that? That means all flows that fulfill the criteria coming, having the same timestamp, being on the same router and having the same protocol, all those flows will be, will be thrown into this one tree. So if you come with a query asking me, can you give me for this timestamp and this router, all flows that were UDP, I can find the tree in constant time and traverse it in linear time. And you cannot make it much faster for querying. This is why this is uh, organized like this. So why did I, did I go for a tree? Um, a tree, for those who don't know, uh, inserting in a tree, uh, the runtime of it is O of log n, where n is the amount of data in the tree already. And searching takes O of log n as well. Um, wouldn't a hash map be better? Because a hash map, you can insert in constant time and find stuff in constant time as well. Sounds better, huh? No, it's not better in this case, at least not with this implementation in Go, because the hash map requires to be copied when it grows above a certain size. So when you, say, you ask Go, give me a hash map, and you add data, well, it fits in until a certain point. The map becomes too full, there's too many collisions popping up, the Go runtime realizes it needs to increase the space for this map, and what it does is it copies it all over to a bigger uh, memory allocation. And this takes a lot of CPU time. And this is spiky. It's like not popping up all the time. It's like you add 1,000 elements, 5,000 elements, 10,000 elements, and suddenly, boom, it has to copy everything. And the CPU goes to 100%. And in that time, uh, I was failing again to decode the packets that were coming in. So of course, I could have increased the buffer space again, or just go for a tree, which allows me more stability of the program. So for a query, as I said, if you come and ask, here's the timestamp, one, two, three, four, here's the router ID, blah, 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 whatever, and I want to have everything for source 8888, let's say. Let's forget the, the last three attributes here down there. Let's say the query stops at 8888. We have this map of maps that allows us to find the tree where all flows are in with source 8888. So what you're asking for is basically this one subtree on the very left top. Query done, simple thing. But what you usually do is you have multiple criteria that you want to query for. In this example, you want to query for all, fl all flows that were coming from source address 8888. The protocol was UDP. You don't care about ICMP, TCP, GRE, whatnot. You just want to have to UDP once. The destination ISN must be 123. And the ingress interface on the router must have an interface number five. That is your query criteria. So how does it work? Again, we can find these four trees. So for all of these four attributes, we have a tree that represents all flows that fulfill this criteria. We have four trees. What we have to find is the common elements of four trees. So what we do is take the left tree, you traverse it. For each element that you find in the tree, you go to the second tree and do a lookup and check out, is this flow also in this tree? If it is, well, it goes into the, res into, into the intermediate result tree down here in the, middle left, in the middle left. If it is not, you skip it, go to the next one. Once you're done with these two, you do the same thing with the two trees on the top right. You traverse the left one, take every element, do a lookup on the right one, see if it's there or not, and build the intermediate result tree. Then you have two intermediate result trees, and then you find the common elements again, and then you have the final result. And then you have all the flows here that fulfill all your criteria that you wanted to have. Um, so how does this perform? Looking up in a tree, as I said, is log n. How often do you do that for two trees? n times, so it's n log n. 
uh, and then you do it in parallel. So what Tflow actually does is it takes the top left two, runs that in one Go routine and finds the, the common elements and takes the top right two and finds the common elements on two other CPU cores at the same time. And then it takes the two results and builds the, uh, the, the, res the final result tree with the, um, with the common elements. So how long does it actually take? N log N to find things. It could be faster with maps again, but the problem is, as I said, the maps will be copied around and you use too much CPU. What I actually have to do is implement the map myself and make it somehow better. But the issue is when you use a hash map, you have to reserve some memory for it. And the amount of data that goes into these trees at the moment can be differing a lot. For example, there can be like one host somewhere on the internet that nobody talks to, just one guy talks to it with one packet. It will get its own tree with just one entry with just one IP address. And there's other IP addresses that have plenty of entries because there have been plenty of flows, like, I don't know, Google front end web server or something. And that has thousands of entries. So what is the ideal size to reserve in terms of memory to avoid copying around? I don't think I will find a better solution than what is there in the Go language anyways at the moment. So probably the best solution is to go for a tree. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, NetFlow is based on this templating thingy from version 9 onwards. Um, you're receiving the templates in a regular basis that explain to you what the data actually has to be interpreted like. So the program has to keep track what templates it actually see. And whenever a flow comes in, there's a flow ID, uh, a template ID, sorry. And with a template ID, you have to look up in the cache, uh, what is the template like? What is, what is it? So I can actually read the data. So first approach was, well, let's have a map, use a string as index, and put the template records in there. Hmm. To access this, I need to build a string, the template key here. And as you can see, what I did in the beginning was I used the format package and the sprintf that creates me a string. And to find the correct template, I needed three informations. First of all, the router ID, because the template IDs are only unique per router. So what I need is the router ID that we are talking about. The, um, uh, the source ID, because you can have multiple sources um, that are reported in the NetFlow header. For us, it's always zero, uh, in my use case at least. Um, but it needs to be there, actually. And the template ID itself needs to be there. So I concatenated these things. Um, yeah, and guess what? This was too slow. This was eating up a lot of CPU time and actually uh, lowering the space, uh, lowering the, the, uh, the speed um, of, ex of, inc of adding data to the database a lot. So the second approach was nested maps. So I just said, okay, let's have a map of UN32, which is the router ID, to a map of UN32, uh, which is the source ID, and have a, then a map on a UN16, which is the template record ID, or the, temp or the template ID, and then just put the template records in there. So this bears me to convert the IP address that I have of the router from net.ip into a string in the first place. The next thing is, this saves me uh, converting a UN32 and a UN16 into a string, and it saves me concatenating the string, and it saves me allocating memory for the string. So I'm not doing anything, basically. I just, I just use data that I have anyways, reinterpret it as UN32s, and use it to access a map in constant time. Much faster. File storage layer. So at one day, uh, I thought like keeping the stuff in RAM for half an hour or an hour, Ah, eh, it's not enough. Maybe I want to keep it on disk for some time. Um, so my first approach was to use the encoding GOP package. GOP is Go binary um, and is the default way to write binary data to disk in Go. Um, turns out, again, it's too slow uh, for the same reason as the binary.read thingy, because it uses reflection. So second approach was, let's try Google protocol buffers. And Google protocol buffers was like more than 50% faster. So using 50% less CPU time, basically. Um, and the nice thing is it can and will be reused uh, for upcoming gRPC API to do automated queries uh, against the Tflow system. 
So at the moment, Tflow only supports queries from the web interface, um, but soon there's going to be an API that you can use with gRPC uh, to query data out of Tflow. Um, and gRPC utilizes Google protocol buffers. So having that as a proto buff there makes the very low hanging fruit to implement uh, the API. So now as I solve the CPU time issue, I had a new problem, this guy. Uh, we have like seven gigabytes of data per day coming in raw, uncom un uh, uncompressed. Uh, writing it is okay, like seven gigabytes during the day is not that much, it's like, I don't know, a few kilobytes per second maybe, or even less, I don't know. Um, but the problem is when you run a query and it affects like a day of data, you have to read seven gigabytes of data from disk. And this can easily take at least two minutes. And two minutes was too long for me. And I was like, hmm, seven gigabytes per day. This is also very limiting in terms of how long can I keep information on disk because disk space is not endless, at least not in Freifunk Rheinland. Um, so what did I do? I started compressing the data because, because of all my previous optimizations, I had some CPU time left over. And CPU time was cheaper than more disk I.O. Um, so I was like, hmm, maybe we can compress it and then write it to disk. That makes the data smaller. And I need less time to write it to disk and read it from disk. And it turns out the effectiveness was increased by 3.5 times. So instead of seven gigabytes per day, per day, I was writing two gigabytes per day, which means you query and it doesn't take two minutes, but it takes you like, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds, around about 30 seconds. To get, a, to get a query done for a whole day, which I found quite good. Um, and the CPU cost to do the, uh, to the compression and decompression um, was actually not very high. Like I wasn't able to see it in the CPU graphs at all on the server. Came at basically close to zero cost, let's say. Um, and I also implemented the annotation layer to get this ASN information that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, there's only the bird annotator for now, but if you want to work with it and you have other sources of information that you want to put on your flow information to make queries, like customer IDs, project IDs, or whatnot, um, this, is the way, this is the point where you can hook in your own module to add more uh, metadata to the flows. Um, but at the moment, the whole Tflow system is not implemented in a way that it would be easy to add new attributes because it would in involved to edit all the uh, all the types and the structs that I have in the in the program, but I think I will rework this quite soon to make it more flexible, uh, as flexible as in the NetFlow version nine protocol. Because right now this, the set of supported attributes is fixed in Tflow two, but maybe I would, I guess I will change that quite soon. Anyways, so for now there's just a bird annotator, and what it does is it talks to a bird instance using the Unix domain socket. It's also used by the bird C command line interface when you are interacting with bird. Um, it does it over a Unix domain socket. Uh, this, is done, this is used in purpose to, uh, to get detailed information um, on routes. For example, you have a flow that comes from 8888 and you want to see what was the prefix in the routing table that was actually used to forward this packet. So we do is a show route eight eight show route four eight 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 on the bird, and the bird tells you here's the prefix. And by the way, this is the AS path, and here's the uh, the destination ASN, um, and it does all these lookups to gather this information um, to, and to be precise, it gathers the source ASN for flow, a destination ASN, the next stop ASN. So what, in which ASN was the next stop op router that the packet was sent to, um, the source prefix and the destination prefix. And of course, it caches the results because you don't want to run to the bird all the time and say, show route this, show route that, show route this, and make it a few thousand times a second. That's not, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't perform very well. Um, so we're caching this. So Tflow 2, is this state-of-the-art flow analysis? I'm not sure. For me, it's the best available um, open source, easy to set up solution at the moment, let's say. Um, it was my first release Go project. You can find it on github.com slash tuckv6 slash tflow2. Um, originally, I released it on github.com slash google slash tflow2. But as I'm not a Google employee anymore for quite a, yeah, for nearly a month now, uh, I forked the project into my own repository. 
Um, it includes very efficient NetFlow version 9 IPFix decoders. It keeps flows in RAM for a configurable amount of time. I source them on disk uh, in a very efficient Google protocol buffer format. Um, we have a usable user interface now, web-based, uh, for easy creation of queries. Uh, and we can annotate flows with, Bert, uh, with PGP information from BERT. Um, and the only downside that I see at the moment is that the API is still somewhat ugly, but gRPC is to the rescue soon. Um, we've quite some known issues at the moment. For example, people are poking me all the time, hey, what about S-Flow? And I'm like, yeah, S-Flow is a lie, but maybe we'll maybe we will support it soon. Um, I have to have a closer look on the protocol. I um, think it wouldn't be too hard to implement it, so that's coming for sure quite soon. Um, one issue is when you reboot a router, the IDs of the interfaces can change, and T-Flow is not keeping track of that. T-Flow only reads in the interface ID, um, and that interface ID that is reported by the router is being saved on disk. So maybe in this moment, interface five is Ethernet zero. You reboot the router and suddenly interface five is actually Ethernet one. T-Flow doesn't take, doesn't get that. And you query it for, inter, for, your, for interface five. And what you can see is that in the one moment there was like this traffic, and next moment there's this traffic because it represents different interfaces. So you have to be careful when reading the, when you're reading this data and to reboot the router. Um, I have quite some ideas how I can uh, circumvent these problems or work around them, um, but we're not there yet. Ah, good idea. Yeah, that could be because that would in, that would in, that would uh, tell us that we have to uh, re-read the mapping from the router, uh, like what physical interface is actually what interface ID at the moment. Uh, good point. Uh, the API that we have is quite ugly, uh, and there's no documentation about it, and there's no guarantee for stability, as it says in the in the README, anyways. Uh, so, don't wonder if in the, in the next version. Uh, your queries on the API will not work anymore. Um, and in some places, we have suboptimal data types, but for the moment, I think it's fair enough because uh, it works quite well and much better than uh, everything else that was that I've seen before and that, that I produced before. Um, so yeah, so lessons learned during development. Um, so if you program for velocity, make sure you avoid reflection. Uh, make sure you avoid memory allocations and copying data around. Every copy operation, costs you CPU time. Um, and if you have al to allocate memory, it costs you even, even way more CPU time. Uh, avoid, con avoid converting data, especially to strings, if you can just use them as an index on a map or something. Don't convert that stuff just to access data. Uh, doesn't make sense. Um, and always, actually, I think it's worth it to compress data before you write it onto the disk. Always. It's always faster. Like CPUs these days are so fast, and disks are still so slow um, that it makes sense to always compress it. And because they're using unsafe package if necessary. So this thingy of casting uh, the information out of this byte array that I have requires me to break the type safety of Go and definitely the unsafe package. Um, I think you should not, if you need velocity, don't be shy to make use of the unsafe package, also, although it is called unsafe. Uh, you just have to be careful in what you're doing and test it well, and then it's fine. Um, and Go is a great language for distributed uh, workflows, uh, distributed like on multiple CPUs on the same machine. It's very simple. Uh, make sure you make use of it wherever you can, if you aim for velocity. Um, and now I want to go for a small demo on TuckFlow um, based on the Freifunk Rheinland backbone. No worries, you will not see any flow information um, showing particular IP addresses because of data protection and stuff. I'm not going to show that to you because I'm not allowed to. But what I can show you is some other metadata. Uh, what I want to show you is uh, a breakdown on our DKIX interface and show you from where is traffic actually coming from which autonomous systems, who are our peers that send us the traffic on the DKIX um, or DKIX port. Um, and Maybe also, where is it actually going to, to which ASN? Um, so let's say 
Ethernet to VLAN 4081. This is the interface for Ingress. So as the router, we are asking for the, ah, let's reload this. This makes a lot of sense. So we go for BBA, Frankfurt 2, and we want to know about Ethernet 2, VLAN 4081. And we want to have a breakdown on, uh, was it source or system number? And we want to have the top 15 flows and the rest will be aggregated into one uh, big chunk. And then you run it. What we can see is this fancy graph that tells us we have around 1.8 gigabits per second of traffic at the moment on the, on the DKX interface. And we can see that one AS here is clearly dominating the ingress traffic uh, into the Freifunk Rheinland backbone, at least on the DKX interface. And that is AS15169, and that is nobody less than Google. So most people on the Freifunk network are just using Google services all the time. So what we actually do is also, um, we can go here and say, uh, we only care about this. And actually what we want is a breakdown by protocol. So we only see traffic from Google and we will see which protocols are actually used here. And we can see is mostly it's protocol six and protocol six in IP is as far as I know TCP and 17 is UDP, and Proto1 is actually ICMP. Um, so here we are, now we can see what types of traffic we have here. What we can also do is we can add another breakdown, let's say um, source port. And what we can see now is, so the top combination is protocol is TCP, and the source port is guess what, 443, because this is all HTTPS connections. And people, uh, probably watching YouTube um, over HTTP, over TCP, over IP, over our DKX port. Uh, and this is stuff you can easily see using TechFlow. And what we're actually analyzing here is a big chunk of data. Um, I think currently in RAM, we have like 50 something gigabytes of data on flows in the RAM. And this is data for up to one hour. And currently we're not saving data uh, on disk for the Freifunk because we don't need it. Uh, for us, it's enough that we can look back for one hour and see from where to where was traffic actually going and then forget about it. So no worries, we're not saving your data for too long. We're saving it for a time window that we actually need it for, like one hour, and that's it. And you keep it in RAM. So if the power of the machine goes, it's all gone. We don't know anything anymore. Um, So thank you for your attention. Um, you can find the program on github.com. Um, I'm open for feature requests. Um, if, you, if there's anything missing that would really help you, feel free to send me your feature request. Um, if you want to send me pull requests, I would appreciate that even more, obviously. I'm open to that. And if you have any questions or comments, um, I would invite you to leave them with me now. No questions? Zero? Well, okay. Then, thank you. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> so it's actually been pretty interesting to hear since I'm working on an open source project unreleased so far, which does pretty much exactly the same thing. It's not quite as far as yours but it's a working prototype. Well, one thing I've been wondering is how you're handling incomplete flows. So like, uh, how's IPTNet flow handling incomplete flows? Is it sending them on completion or is it sending them every few seconds? Um, you mean flows that haven't been terminated yet? Yeah, exactly. So it is like exporting them every, sec every 60 seconds is what we yeah. have configured. Even though if the flow is still active, it gets exported. And then the byte counter and the uh, packet counter gets reset. So in the next one, it's not reporting the bytes from the previous time window again. I see. So in, and in Tflow, you're just aggregating it as it comes in. Uh, exactly. I 
yeah, I'm not aggregating them over the time. I save every time for every timestamp. I save the data individually, so I can graph them over the time. So you're not just you're not like uh, merging them later once the flow is complete. No, I see. So. One interesting observation has been that uh, a large percentage of our traffic is actually in long-lived TCP sessions. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first approach was to merge them afterwards, but it quickly got too, too resource-intensive to, to go back and, mm -hmm. uh, and merge them later. And, yeah. So you really wanted to see how much data one flow that was living very long was actually transmitting. So you're interested in the, in the, in the, in the, in the volume of the traffic. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it really, it really skewed the statistics since mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was accounted for when the flow was complete. Mm. So yeah, really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome.